Okay, so how do we respond to challenging behavior? All of those um, interventions I just talked about are preventative or ante antecedent interventions. So what is the consequence if a challenging behavior does occur? And one thing that we use is something called extinction. So extinction just means that if uh, an ind individual engages in challenging behavior, we're not reinforcing that challenging behavior. And it just depends on the function. So what that looks like is if they're wanting your attention, you don't provide a lot of attention um, to that behavior. If they want access to an item or activity, they don't get access to that item or activity. And if they want escape from work, then they don't get escape from work if they're engaging in the challenging behavior. Um, so this graph shows an example of what it can look like if, or what it usually does look like if extinction is used. So it's just a note that there um, is something called an extinction burst. So if you are, so baseline levels, before we start intervention, um, this is what the challenging, this is where the challenging behavior is at. And once we start extinction, we often see a spike in challenging behavior. We may also see other behaviors that we haven't seen before because what has been working to get them what they want is no longer working. So you see an increase. They're trying harder. They're trying other things to get what they want. Um, but once, as long as you get through that extinction burst, we see a rapid decrease in the challenging behavior, as you can see there. I sometimes think of like a vending machine. So say you put money into a vending machine and normally we get what we want after we put the money in there. But say this time they don't, um, it doesn't work. So then you start pressing all the buttons and you start maybe hitting the vending machine to get what you want. Um, so that's kind of like our little extinction burst during that time. Um, and if you do need to respond to challenging behavior, we recommend re reinforcing low levels of challenging behavior. So for Michael, he engaged in um, a precursor of screaming. So he would usually scream before he would engage in self-injury. So if we needed to reinforce the challenging behavior, we, we would reinforce screaming instead of, instead of the self-injury. Okay. So um, once again, ABA is a function-based approach. Um, finding the function is very important um, to provide a good intervention. And we always determine treatment by function rather than what the behavior looks like. So we're not focused on what it looks like. We're focused on why it's occurring and what is maintaining that behavior. Um, and prevention is key. So we do want to identify and incorporate preferences. So for example, with Michael, um, we needed to find his preferences so we could see what we needed to teach him to communicate for or what he was willing to do work for and what will increase that appropriate behavior in the future. Um, we do want to make sure expectations are clear. Um, so that's using the visuals um, to help signal in the environment what's going on. And then we always want to teach and reinforce communication. So not always focusing just on the challenging behavior. We do need to focus on the appropriate alternative behavior as well. We have a tendency as a society to, and not just as a society, probably as humans, to <coughs> pay attention to the stuff that's bad, the things that get our attention, because we need to address that, like the challenging behavior. And we have a tendency to kind of coast along when things are going well. So what really is the core of ABA, like the, what we're best at, is preventing problem behavior, using those preventative strategies that, um, that Ashley was talking about, like FCT, right, functional communication training, um, helping them deal with things that are hard so that they can gradually build the skills to make it less hard. Those preventative strategies are most important. Um, but we often miss those opportunities. And when challenging behavior happens, it's about not making it worse, is the key thing. And that's harder than it sounds. So um, one of the services that Autism Treatment Center provides is a school for students who have such severe challenging behavior that they cannot be served in a public school setting. So their districts contract with us to provide their education all under sort of the umbrella of ABA. So when you're talking severe behavior, 
here, it is extremely dangerous. Some of it is life-threatening when it happens. And the way that it got so severe was through extinction gone wrong. Um, this makes common sense, right? And so we say, don't provide the reinforcer for the challenging behavior. Keep that demand in place. Um, try to ignore that attention-seeking behavior. But when it gets worse, before it gets better, what often ends up happening is at that top of the, the burst, we end up saying, this is crisis, we're gonna have to respond. And the next time that child is gonna go to that high point even more quickly, and you're gonna say, oh, we reinforced this last time, let's try to hold back. And they're gonna go even harder next time, and even higher. And so, we, we, it's interesting to me, like, in ABA we talk a lot about, or the, the board talks a lot about how only um, trained experts can do functional analyses. But really with a functional analysis, you're reinforcing each instance of the behavior as soon as it occurs. Extinction, I think, is a lot harder to do procedurally, and there's a much bigger risk involved. So, that's just one of my big concerns about APA sometimes, is that we teach people about extinction, and people say, okay, let's try to extinguish it, and then we fail most of the time. And um, that we shake up the strategic behavior. So, really, it's about prevention. And when you're consulting with teachers, let's say, and they say, I don't have time to be sitting with this child to do functional communication training all day. I say, you don't have to do that all day, you know? You can do um, two or three 10 minute practice sessions, and then you're spending 30 minutes the whole day. Whereas if you go to this, if you miss that opportunity to prevent and to teach an alternative behavior, and you end up going to extinction, Probably gonna, you might have to spend two hours writing out that behavior, um, and you're probably going to not be able to get past those two hours, and just a lot more can go wrong. Comment. I'm not sure if everyone understands the graph, but sure. the baseline is established in the line between down is actually the application of the intervention, and then we see the increase frequency. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I remember um, when I first started looking at these graphs, it was yeah, it didn't make any sense to me. So, say um, each, this is on days, but um, sometimes this happens in the course of minutes, um, seconds, sometimes hours as well, right? So, this is, you know, screaming is happening. Let's say this is just about the amount of, at a, at a level of intense, let's say it's not screaming, let's say it's self injury. If I told you about that kiddo, maybe hitting his, his elbow on the table, it's happening about, you know, five on a 10 point scale. So we wish it didn't happen, but um, but yeah, it's, it's it's not that severe, right? But then if say the child is doing this to get your attention and you stop attending to it at that baseline right there, you um, put it on extinction because it's attention seeking, that child that you just let them go at it might bloody their elbow, right? And then um, you respond in crisis and you won't get the opportunity to go all the way down that curve. So um, prevent whenever you can. The other thing I wanted to talk about was I said that I would address um, the competition between positive and negative reinforcement, but I never did really. So um, there's always like the, the, tend the um, desire to escape or avoid, get out of various things, but then you do things for good reasons too, and that's true for all of our kids. So, you know, in the morning, you kind of want to avoid work, you want to stay in bed, but at the same time, you want to go to work to make money, and there's that competition there. Our kids have that all the time. And we want to use that to our advantage and kind of load the pot towards positive reinforcement by and large. Because negative reinforcement involves getting out of stuff we don't like. And with kids who have autism or other disabilities, the more they avoid and escape, the less opportunity they have to learn. So, say a kiddo is avoiding math class. The first question, the first procedure should not be keep that kid in math, math class no matter how much problem behavior he has because we're going to do extinction. It needs to be why is math class aversive? Right? Um, is, it, is it the content? If so, let's find a way to teach that content more appropriately. 
but maybe it's also just really boring. So the first question is, what is that child interested in? If they're really interested in, say, Pokemon, how can we incorporate Pokeballs into our math lessons, right? And then that's why preference assessment first is so important, because you should be considering how you can use that information at each step of your intervention, as opposed to defaulting to this, which is likely to go wrong. You probably have to do some component of this, but in reality, it's really about that ratio. It's not all or nothing. It's like less of that reinforcer for problem behavior and more of it, better of it for appropriate behavior. <coughs> and embedding those preferences into the things that the child is tending to avoid in really creative ways. I think that's where you'll find the most um, reinforcing interventions for you and for the family at large. Also, as Ashley said, with, um, with Michael's graph here, with the SIB, this really is striking with that six month break. And this is completely attributable to parent training. This is my other um, soapbox or qualified, sometimes clinical interventions, and most of you are school based, so I'm kind of preaching the choir here. Uh, but school has its own problem with it. But when we do things out of context, that generalization is just not going to naturally happen. But if you systematically train people across contexts to do the same thing you're doing, you can get interventions that maintain over time. And so if this child had not been given a communication system for 15 years, I had not found something that worked for him, other than if I bite myself hard enough or long enough, people do enough stuff that eventually they're going to get what I want. And so that's why we saw that he really had all of the social functions to some extent. It was because we all do, right? Sometimes we want water, sometimes we want to go home, and sometimes we want something to talk to us. And so did he. He just had no way of communicating that. But grandma just really took to this intervention. She was practicing. We used video conferencing, telehealth, um, to support mom in the home, because our grandma. Because even bringing grandma into the having your practice there is not the same thing as having grandma practice at home. So use those tools that are available to you to do that training 